Before our message this morning, please listen to the special music. Sunday morning to you church it's a blessing to be back here at the church house once again and I want to bring you a message this morning that is entitled when opposites attract when opposites attract the question this morning I will ask you as we begin our message what would you do to determine whether something in your life was essential or it wasn't uh, we say today either essential or non-essential what would you use uh, to arrive at your list what would be the qualifiers that you would use to include something in your list that is essential or it isn't essential uh, this morning i want to look at a passage of scripture in the book of acts uh, chapter number 10 <clears throat> we're going to look at a lot of different uh, verses this morning uh, it's the story of a gentile roman centurion named Cornelius, and an Orthodox Jewish preacher named Peter. Uh, how these two came together, uh, what did God do to uh, establish the relationship? How did he bring it to pass? I want to look at those things this morning, and then I want to talk about some things that are essential uh, this morning for us as a church. And to get a proper understanding of the significance of this story, we must also understand what it meant to be a centurion in the Roman government back in the days of the early church. Uh, we also know that the Jews of this time uh, that were associated, that were being oppressed by the Roman government to some extent, uh, the Romans afforded uh, a peaceful time for those people in and around the Roman uh, uh, emperor's regime and all those things, but, but they were still oppressed people. They were forced to pay exorbitant taxes and all those other things. And so the Jews of that time period were a proud people. They did not like the oppression that the Romans were putting on them. As a matter of fact, they were looking to their Messiah to come and set them free and be a, 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 a fighter for freedom and all those things. Uh, they were careful not to associate with the Gentiles uh, during that time period, as long as they could help, as far as they could help it. Uh, there was a mindset that all other people outside of the Jewish uh, uh, Jewish uh, uh, nation were to be avoided at all costs. We certainly know the understanding of how the Jews treated Samaritans and so on and so forth. So 
But our story takes place in the book of Acts chapter number 10, and then it sort of carries over into Acts chapter 11. And so uh, the location that we're talking about here is a place called Caesarea, and it was uh, predominantly a Roman city uh, on the shores of the Mediterranean in a place called Judea. It is also believed to be the place that Pontius Pilate uh, made his permanent residence. And in order to make the rank of centurion, was the first thing that was required is one must be a patriot's patriot. You had to be uh, very loyal to the cause. Uh, you had to be a very loyal government person in order to be uh, put to the rank of centurion. In other words, you had to be extremely loyal to the Roman emperor. Now, each Roman province had a centurion leading that province's garrison of soldiers. And uh, there were 32 different provinces in and around the Roman Empire of this time period. And in each one of those provinces, there was a centurion that sort of uh, led the garrison of soldiers at each place. And because Cornelius would have been viewed by the Jews as an enemy of Judaism, uh, there would have been a natural hatred or dislike amongst the Jews of this man named uh, Cornelius. Uh, we know that if Cornelius was considered a Roman's Roman, Peter, on the other hand, would have been considered a Jew's Jew. Uh, we know the Bible records several places where Peter himself uh, was uh, not really uh, very uh, welcoming to some of the Gentiles that uh, were looking to be saved in the early church. And uh, Paul had to rebuke him about that later on. But I'm taking the time today to lay this foundation for you for our message to show you that with God, all things are possible. Uh, with God, all things are possible. He can, he can do wondrous works if we'll just simply submit ourselves to his leadership or his authority. As much as Cornelius and the rest of the Roman Empire would have been a, a despised by the average Jew, God still had a plan for Cornelius. Uh, God has a plan for every person uh, that's ever been born. Uh, God has a perfect will for every person's life. Uh, there are certain things that God wants. And first of all, most of all, he wants every man, every boy, every girl, every woman, every child, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your background is, your nationality, your socioeconomic status, any of those things, God wants you to be saved. That is critical. Uh, and it also involves... Uh, not only this Roman uh, uh, centurion named Cornelius, but it also involved this devout Jew named Peter. You know, sometimes God uses the improbable to do the impossible. Uh, we know that in Acts chapter 10, if you look there with me this morning, uh, that Cornelius was a devout man who feared the God of Israel. Now, remember, in the Roman Empire back at this time period, uh, the Romans had a lot of different gods. They had gods like Zeus and uh, Apollos and all kinds of other uh, 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 pagan gods that the Roman people, uh, you know, sort of worship. But for some reason, Cornelius was a man who recognized the God of Israel, and he had a, a relationship as best he knew how at this point in time of his life uh, with uh, the God of Israel. He and his entire house were God-fearing people. The Bible tells us that. In, Ro in Acts chapter uh, 10 and verse 2, the Bible says this about Cornelius a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. What does it mean? First of all, in that passage of scripture in verse number two, the word God is with a capital G and that signifies that that is the God of Israel. It's the God of the Bible. It's the God that we Christians uh, worship also today. So, <coughs> excuse me. So one day at the ninth hour, here we find Cornelius praying. By the way, the ninth hour of the day is 3 p.m. in the afternoon. While Cornelius was at home fasting and praying, God sends an angel to visit him. The angel calls him out by name and says, Cornelius. And in Acts chapter 10 and verse 4, uh, the Bible says the following, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. The angel tells Cornelius that God had taken notice of his activities. He had taken notice of his prayer and he had taken notice of his alms. And the Bible tells us that God uses angels as his messengers oftentimes, uh, not to preach, but to call men's attention to the things of God. Remember uh, in the Lord's birth, the angels 
uh, sort of called out and, and brought the attention to that, uh, that little uh, manger scene there in Bethlehem when the Lord Jesus was born. And so God uses angels to oftentimes call attention to the things that he wants men to pay attention to. And then he will then work through somebody and bring, uh, bring his point to bear. But today God has appointed the task of preaching to men who have been called to preach. Witnessing is the responsibility of all Christians, but preaching is the responsibility of pastors and preachers who have been called by God to do so. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I want to summarize for you part of chapter number 10, just so that we won't run too long on our message this morning. And I want to summarize the details leading up to Peter's encounter uh, with Cornelius. First of all, God tells Cornelius uh, in chapter number 10, he says, I want you to send some men to this place called Joppa, and I want you to bring a man named Peter back to your house. I want them to bring the man named Peter back to your house. And God tells Cornelius that it is Peter which will bring the essential message that Cornelius needs. And so uh, being obedient and wanting to serve and, and please God, Cornelius gathers three of his men together and he sends them off. Uh, to the place where Peter is. And uh, at the same time in, in Cornelius' life, when God is speaking and uh, bringing his attention with the angel to uh, the need that he has to be have this encounter with Peter, at that same time uh, as that's happening, over there in Joppa, Peter, the following day, is getting ready to receive his own message from God. And his own message from God tells Peter this. Look at uh, with God, he is not a respecter of persons. In other words, Peter, your message that you have to deliver, your gospel message is as important to, uh, as, to Gentiles as it is to Jews. It's as important to Samaritans as it is to Jews. And what God says to Peter is, if I've determined that something is uh, appropriate, don't you dare say it's not. Don't you dare determine something that I've said is clean is unclean. And he, God sort of uses that metaphor of food uh, because we know the Bible has a lot to say about uh, 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 kosher food and non-kosher food and what's clean and what's unclean and all those things. And God uses that to tell Peter, listen, you preach to who I tell you to preach to uh, by the spirit of God. I will lead you to preach to the people that you're supposed to preach. But if I tell you to preach to a certain one, don't you dare say, no, uh, that's not what God would have me to do. Remember, God is our authority in all manner of faith and practice. That's why he gives us uh, this book. So at the time that God is at work in Cornelius's life, the following day, he will be also at work in Peter's life. You know, God has a way of uniting circumstances in men's lives uh, uh, throughout our world uh, to bring the common goal together of bringing men to Christ. Uh, we know from missionaries that we've supported over the years as a church, Faith Baptist Church cannot go to every part of the world. But what we can do is we can partner with men who are missionaries that can go to those places and they can reach uh, those people in those faraway countries that we would never have an opportunity to reach. But you know this, here's the good news. When we get to heaven one day, we're gonna be able to meet people from the Philippines that have been born again the Bible way. Why? Because we pay and we send support to missionaries there who are doing that work. Hey, we're gonna meet people from St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, that we have supported Brother John Zwingle there in St. Petersburg, Russia. He has been bringing the gospel to that part of the world. We're going to meet people in heaven that have been saved under the preaching and teaching of Brother John Zwingle, and God has used him to bring people into the fold. Uh, we're going to reach people in India. We're going to reach people in Alaska. We're going to reach people all over in Ecuador and in Africa, all those places that we support missionaries. We have had a part as a church in reaching the lost. And so God sometimes uses circumstances from different places in our life to accomplish his common goal of bringing people to Christ. So Peter also sees a vision where God uses those unclean and clean animals and teaches Peter, Peter the lesson that God is not a respecter of persons and that Peter should not decide on his own who God appoints to receive the gospel and the salvation and who he doesn't. Now, that's not our business. And we follow the Spirit's leadership as we testify of the greatness and the necessity that all men have for Christ. The Spirit then illuminates to Peter that three men will visit him. And no sooner is this vision 
uh, does this vision take place? The next thing you know, guess what? Here's a knock on the door. Peter's got three visitors at his door looking for him. Those men that have been sent by Cornelius to bring Peter there to uh, see him uh, reach uh, Cornelius. And so after receiving the Spirit's direction, Peter greets the men from Cornelius and he agrees to return with them the following day. And upon arriving at Cornelius's house in chapter number 10, we're going to read some scriptures here now. Peter finds that a significant group has gathered there in anticipation of Cornelius's arrival. See, Cornelius had the forethought to say, hey, look it, uh, I've got uh, a man of God coming. I've sent for him. My men are on their way to get him right now. When he gets back to this place, he's going to deliver what I believe to be a very important message from the God of heaven, the God of the Israelites. And it would behoove you to be here to listen to what he has to say. It's an important time. He's bringing some essential truths to us uh, as a people. And we would be well advised to be here in our place, be ready to listen. You know, when we come to the church house on Sunday morning, just like what Cornelius told his friends and his family, we need to be telling our family and friends the same thing. We need to be telling them, hey, listen, hey, at the church house at 28 Platt Street in Winooski, Vermont, every Sunday morning, uh, God speaks through his, his preacher and through his, his uh, Sunday school teachers and through his uh, witnessing of the Faith Baptist Church. He is going to speak some essential truths that every person needs to hear. And, it, and it's, it's our responsibility as Christians to make sure that we are doing our part to make sure that those folks that we love and care about get the essential messages that they need to hear. And the sad truth is we're not doing a very good job at that a lot of times. See, our problem is, as Christians that have been born again the Bible way, uh, we have tried over the years to reach our loved ones and... And many times we say, well, you know, I've talked to them. They just don't want to listen. They don't want any part of what's going on. So, you know, what can I do? And so we kind of give up a little bit. But I'm telling you this morning that if, 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 if God can use a Roman centurion who is a Gentile, who knows really nothing specific about the God of Israel other than the little bits and pieces that he's been able to get hold of, if he can use a man who's a patriot's patriot on the Roman Empire, and he can take a man who's the Jew's Jew in the name of Peter, somebody who these two would not even see eye to eye, there would be a, a natural dislike or disdain for each other because of who they are. If God can take these two people, and he can take one that has the essential message and bring him to another who, who needs to hear that message, and he can unite those two, and he can soften Cornelius's heart so that Peter's message gets through. I'm here to tell you this morning that God can do anything he chooses to do if we'll just get out of the way and allow him to do it and be obedient to what his word, uh, his word says to us this morning. Let's pick up the story this morning in Acts chapter number 10. And we're going to read here verses 25 through 29. We've been skipping a little bit for the sake of time, but let's read uh, verses 25 through 29 of, uh, of Acts chapter 10. The Bible says, and as Peter was coming in, so he's arrived at Cornelius's house, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Now on the surface, you think, well, that seems a little bit strange. It's really strange considering that the Roman centurion would have had the authority over Peter. Uh, Peter would have been a subject to this Roman centurion, but when Peter comes in, uh, 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 the, the, the centurion, the one who's in authority, falls down at Peter's feet, and the Bible says, and worshipped him. Can you imagine this picture? Can you imagine Cornelius' friends and family and maybe some of his soldiers that are gathered around there and they see that their authority, their authority figure in Cornelius, the centurion, falls down at the feet of a Jewish preacher named Peter. But look what happens next. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, ye know how that it is unlawful, it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So right there, we see very clearly that Peter is there 
at the direction of God. Uh, Peter is simply being obedient to God's calling and God's leadership, the Spirit's leadership. And Peter is getting ready to do exactly what God had led him by the Spirit to do. Uh, notice he says, you know that it is unlawful thing for a man to keep, uh, that is a Jew, to keep company. Now, there again, there's that little rub, if you will, that these two parties, the, the, the preacher from, from uh, the, the Jewish side of the house, uh, would have had no business uh, preaching and telling the Roman centurion anything, but it not be for God. You see, that's the thing. God can bring these things together. God can bring uh, two uh, opposites, and these two opposites can attract in the sense that God has a message that all men need, and God can work the circumstances, and he can bring the two together. And that's what's beginning to happen. So Cornelius tells Peter the reason God has determined to bring the two together. Cornelius relates to Peter that God had informed him of his need to hear Peter's message. Think about it. Uh, did Cornelius know Peter prior to this? I I'm not really sure. He may have. Uh, but certainly he knew uh, enough of, of listening to the God, uh, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. God had impressed upon Cornelius' heart and life enough to know that there was a man named Peter that the angel had spoken to him uh, and told him, hey, this man Peter has the message. It's an essential message. You, Cornelius, need to hear what Peter has to say. And so he tells Peter, it's God that's brought you here. God has brought you here and uh, he has something that you have that I need to hear. And Cornelius had an essential need that is common to all men. If you've never heard the gospel message before, if you have never uh, seen a presentation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, as a man, uh, you have an essential need to hear that message. Everyone does. Uh, the Bible said God is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, uh, but is, is, uh, he, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, the Lord doesn't want anybody to perish unsaved. He wants all men to be saved. And we're going to see that here in just a minute. But uh, Cornelius had the essential need that is common to all men. They need to hear the gospel. So first of all, the first point I want to make with you this morning is this. It was essential in God's timing for Cornelius to receive the gospel message. I want you to think about something for a second as we talk about this. Uh, here's Cornelius, and he's at his house at three o'clock in the afternoon. God sends the angel to visit him and calls him out by name and says, Cornelius, I want you to go get Peter. Bring him to your house. He's got a message that you need to hear. Uh, think about this with relation to our soul winning efforts that we are always trying to do. Uh, you know, we're trying to do the best we can. We're trying to uh, uh, bring uh, folks to Christ that we know. And, and but, but notice how this whole thing begins. This whole thing begins because Cornelius is, uh, the Bible says he's fasting and he's doing alms and he's trying to probably in his mind do the best he can. Uh, knowing a little bit about God that he does. He's trying to be uh, a good man, if you will, uh, in spite of the fact that he's a Roman centurion and he's charged with authority and charged with overseeing soldiers. He's doing his best to try to be the man of, uh, that he's supposed to be. And he's trying to be, you know, caring to some folks. And the Bible says he was doing alms. That means that he was looking after the needs of some folks. But here he is trying to do the best he can. And here Peter is, uh, you know, several miles away in this place called Joppa, and God is getting ready to deliver a message to him that says, hey, look it, you're going to get a visit from three people, and they're going to bring you to a man who needs to hear what you have to say. It, but you see how this works? It, it's like God's in the process in both ends. He's in the process of Cornelius. He's in the process of Peter, and God brings them together. Let me tell you this this morning. According to the Gospel of John, except the Father draw, no man will be saved. What was happening in Cornelius' life is God was drawing him 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the other end of town, here's Peter. He's got the message that, God, that Cornelius needs. He's got that essential message and he's obedient to bring it at the right time in the right way uh, with the right, uh, the, uh, the right motives and all those things. And can I tell you, we would go far to listen to God speak to our hearts with relation to winning folks to Christ. Uh, hey, winning folks to Christ isn't up to us. It's up to God to work in people's hearts. It's up to us to pray and intercede for them on their behalf and to make sure that we're praying for those folks that we know that are lost, that God would do a work in their heart like he did in Cornelius' heart. There's no one who wants people saved more than God. Why can't we just understand this process of soul winning is not up to us to get in people's faces and say, hey, do you know this and do you know this? Let God do the work and let's be ready ourselves to operate in God's program rather than try to reinvent and do everything on our own. We would go far. You know, in recent months, there's been a lot of discussion over what is essential and what is not. For instance, it's been determined essential that people have access to marijuana and alcohol. For some strange reason, unbeknownst to me, I have no idea uh, why this is. I kind of have some suspicions, but I don't know for sure. I don't have inside information. But it's essential for people to have access to marijuana and alcohol. Yet it's not essential for a person to purchase certain building supplies if he's trying to do repairs on his home. Now, it's essential in some places in our country for a woman to have an abortion, but it's not essential for a woman to have an operation to remove a cancerous tumor. We've been told it's essential to protect every life. Yet in some places, activities that will surely jeopardize people's lives on a normal basis are allowed to continue. I don't understand this at all. And I really honestly don't think our politicians understand it either. They're just shooting in the dark many times. Now, in the beginning of all this, you remember my messages that I've been preaching to you, church, over the last several weeks. I've told the church and I've asked the church to be, to, to be patient, to be calm, to wait for this thing to play through and this thing to play out. And, and I still believe it's important for us as a church to keep our testimony and not to allow ourselves to get ahead of things and, and start... Uh, uh, using this thing called civil disobedience because I don't see that in the scriptures anywhere. Uh, the, the times that I do see it, it's not of God. But I'll just say this. Uh, we need to be careful to protect our testimony as a church. Faith Baptist Church does not want to get the stigma, uh, if you will, of causing a ruckus and causing a stir because I'm telling you, that's not going to reach people, I don't believe, uh, not in the day and age that we're living. So we still have to be patient. But God has determined himself what is essential. It's not up to politicians to determine what's essential for mankind. It's not up to the governor to determine in the state of Vermont what's essential and what's not. What gives the governor the right to say to the people of Vermont, your business can succeed, your business has to fail, because in my mind, you're not essential, but you are. I don't think he has the authority to say that. I'm not asking you to cause a stir over this. I'm just you know, talking and, and giving you some thoughts that I have about this. We still need to remember to keep our testimony and all those things. But God is the one who determines what is essential. It's God who tells us the things that we need and the things that we do not need. Uh, and, you know, in God's word, he tells us how to handle pandemics. He shows us from the, from the Bible how to handle a person who's sick, how to wash our hands, how to make sure that we're taking precautions to keep people healthy. God's word tells us all of those things. It's not up to them to determine for me what is essential. It's up to God to determine for me what's essential. So as we go through this Certain circumstances of, of this story this morning in Acts chapter 10, certain circumstances summoned Peter to deliver that life-saving message of hope to Cornelius. What would have happened if Peter was wrapped up in something else and he had his mind all jumbled up in something else? Would he have been able to receive the message that God was sending I think that there's some question that could be raised about that. I'm just saying to you, in many places in our country, it's been determined that the church is not essential. I don't know if you've noticed it, but here in our own state of Vermont, uh, the discussion of the churches 
is eerily absent. I, I can't remember, honestly, of any of the times that the governor has been in front of the people and he has said, hey, this is what we consider. This is the things that we uh, that we think the churches should be doing. This is what I see for the church. I haven't heard that discussion anywhere. It's like it's almost been ignored completely. And But can I tell you, the church is essential. Is it essential that we have to meet at this church house in order to do the work of God? No, not necessarily. But I will tell you this, and I'm going to show you here in a minute that it is essential for the church to have its place in the community. The church is essential to the city of Winooski. It's the church that holds the essential message of eternal life. Uh, if one thing is for sure, the city of Winooski in the state of Vermont needs this essential message of being saved the Bible way. Now, we who are saved know that this message can be received anywhere, at any time, as long as the Lord is leading. But we also know that the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. As Christians, as Christian people here gathered together at Faith Baptist Church on a normal basis, uh, we represent the church in this local community. Uh, we're not an invisible, universal church. We are a local, visible church made up of the body of believers here at Faith Baptist Church. And we here in this church are the pillar and ground of the truth in Winooski. As far as I know, we're the only one. Therefore, when, it's, when, when, when the church is the pillar and ground of the truth according to the word of God, it's, it, it's, it, 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 when we're not able to meet on a normal basis and we're not able to interact on a normal basis, we cannot get the essential message that people need to hear out to people because we've been forbidden to interact with them. Uh, the people who need to be saved are being, it's limited how we can reach and approach those folks. The church cannot do the job that God intended it to do under the current circumstances that we have. And it's, and it's been, the church has been, uh, been uh, deemed non-essential. Now understand, we can continue to preach via the internet, and in the beginning, until we knew the scope of this word, we wanted to be good citizens. So that's what we've been doing, and we're continuing to do that. But in order to provide counsel and guidance to those who accept the invitation, like Cornelius, those that accept the gospel message that Cornelius did, it is essential for the church to once again be able to operate and have personal interaction with people. That's the church. That's the ministry. Interaction with people on a face-to-face, one-on-one basis. Uh, it's up to the church to be, an, be an, uh, an extra advocate for Christians, to teach them, to guide them, to give them a place of fellowship, to bear each other's burdens, to pray, to be uh, together at the same place on an appointed time. And by the way, that's God's design. In our text, back to our text, once again, Peter arrives at the house of Cornelius in chapter number 10. And from the initial uh, coming in uh, to Cornelius' house, uh, Peter unfolds the message of Christ from the beginning of Christ all the way to his resurrection. And he also tells of Jesus showing himself alive to certain witnesses. And it was at that moment that the Lord commissioned Peter and others to be those witnesses to preach the essential gospel of Jesus Christ. Those men that were gathered there together, and as the Lord showed himself alive after his resurrection on those instances uh, that he did, he came to them and he commissioned them and he said, listen, I want you to go and teach and bring folks to a saving knowledge of myself. Why did he say that? Because God has determined God has determined that that is an essential message that every man, every boy, every woman, every girl needs to hear. Because without it, they will go out into an eternity lost and separated from God forever. And none of us want to see anybody that we know head into that direction. Go back to our text, Acts chapter 10. We're going to go up to jump ahead a little bit here to verse 44. 
and we're going to read verses 44 and 45. And the Bible says, while Peter yet spake these words, now remember, he's at Cornelius' house. He's unfolding this long history of Jesus Christ from the beginning all the way through his resurrection and his, his uh, meeting with those uh, few witnesses after the resurrection before he's ascended into heaven. So while Peter spake these words, here's what happens. The Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. Did you know when we preach here at the church, we may have people come to our church who are unsaved. But as I unfold and I preach the word of God, if I'm doing it the way that God tells me to do it, uh, as I put the word of God out, those people who are here, whether they're saved or unsaved, the Holy Ghost is going to begin to do a work in their life and their heart. Now, I know sometimes as a preacher, I think to myself, what do I have to do to reach this group? It seems like sometimes you preach and it's like you're preaching to the wall. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody's listening. But you know what? That's not my concern. My concern is to preach, thus saith the Lord. And as long as I'm doing that, I have done my part. So the Bible says, while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, there it is. God's Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is for everyone. It's not just for a select few people of a certain race or color or national origin. God's Word is for all men. God treats all men the same. He is no respecter of persons when it comes to this thing of salvation. God doesn't play favorites. That God wants all men to be saved. I told you earlier that God is not even slack concerning his promise. He wants all men to be saved. And so here in our text this morning, as we look at this passage of scripture, uh, uh, Peter's preaching, the Holy Ghost begins to do the work. And guess what's happening? People are being convicted. In other words, they're beginning to listen to Peter's words. And they're thinking, you know what? He's talking to me. You know, that's me he's talking about. I need to hear these things. I need to know these things because I don't know. And I need to know them because why? God has determined that that message is essential. Notice the Bible says here, they heard the word. They heard the word. It doesn't say they heard Peter's eloquent speech. It doesn't say that they heard Peter uh, 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 expound for them in a glorious manner uh, his own story of what he saw. No, it says he heard, they heard the word. Not Peter's eloquent story, but it was the word of God that did the work. That's why at Faith Baptist Church here in Winooski, we believe it is critically important that this book remains the main thing. Because it's this book, the Word of God, that has the power to change a man's life. This is where the power is. We're simply messengers to relate to people what this book says. That's it. At the beginning of Acts chapter 11, I told you this morning we'd be in Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11. So over here in Acts chapter 11, we see what happens Peter goes to Cornelius, he preaches the word, the spirit of God comes on many that are there, they begin to be convicted, and they begin to make decisions and change some things in their life, and I believe Cornelius is saved, and, and so on, so on, and, but now we come over to chapter 11, Peter leaves, and the Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter 11, the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, that means those Orthodox Jews, uh, contended with him saying, thou wentest into a man uncircumcised and didst eat with him? What does that sound like? It sounds a lot to me like those Jews that were at Jerusalem, those Orthodox Jews who I believe many were unsaved, they had a problem that Peter brought the message of the gospel of Christ to these people in the Gentile world who were unsaved. I think they had a problem. And I think, quite honestly, they were so far off base from what God would have them to do that it's really quite comical. You see, as men, we oftentimes think we know better than what God knows. But the truth of the matter is the Jews in Judea were more concerned about keeping the group of believers pure in their mind than they were about following the commandments of God. That's a problem for us today because here it is. 
God wants all men to be saved. He wants all men to receive the essential message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we as Christians today can act the same way. We can act the same way with the unsaved. We can determine in our minds, I well, that one there, he's, he, he's a drug dealer, he's this, he's that, or he's a, he's a Muslim or some other thing. He isn't deserving of the same grace in the gospel that I enjoy. And oftentimes we just simply ignore them. We don't even attempt to win them. We don't even attempt to be nice to them. We just sort of pass them off as those folks are silly, they're foolish. Uh, they don't even deserve to hear what I've heard. But can I tell you this morning, but for the grace of God, there go I. Acts chapter 11 and verse 4 tells us that Peter anticipated this. Peter kind of knew when he was on his way back from, from uh, 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 Caesarea, as he was headed towards Jerusalem, he kind of anticipated that this was going to be the mindset of those uh, Jewish brothers that he knew when he got back there. Why do we know that? It's because in verse 4 of chapter 11, the Bible says, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning. So he was obviously working this song over in his mind. He was kind of working over what he was going to say. He knew he was going to come under some scrutiny for what he had done. And so it says this, and expounded it by order unto them, saying, I was in the city of Java praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, a certain vessel descend, as it had been a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me, upon the which when I had fastened my eyes, I considered and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts and creeping things, fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay and eat. But I said, No, so, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath any time entered into my mouth. But the voice of God answered me and again and from heaven and said, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou un, uh, common. Uh, and, uh, and this was done three times. And so we know what God was doing. He was teaching Peter a strong lesson that it wasn't up to him to circumvent God's authority and to, to determine to God what would happen. It's up to God to determine to us what happens. We're simply to be obedient. Peter then relates to them the Spirit of God told him to go, and the Bible says, nothing doubting. He says, nothing, don't even question this, don't even doubt this. What I'm telling you is true. You just go and do what you're told to do. That was good enough for Peter, and thank God Peter was, was obedient to what God told him to do. You know, can I tell you this? If the Spirit of God told us, do this, nothing doubting, my question is this would we do it? Oh, I think some would, but you know, I also know some wouldn't. Peter had the message of salvation. He had the message of salvation to all that would believe. I can't think of anything more important at this time in our history in Vermont or in America that's more important than the essential, uh, the essential message of the birth, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you? Peter had the message of salvation to all who would believe. I can't think of anything more essential than that. Acts chapter 11, verse 17. Look here, if it, if we look at this verse with me real quickly. We're almost done. It's a key verse for we Christians because what it says to us should be our marching orders for life. Verse 17, for as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I? that I could withstand God. You know, Peter is basically saying here, when I got the message, who was I to say to God, well, no, I don't think that's good. I don't think that's what you'd have me to do. Uh, I think this would be better. Peter is saying, who was I? And who are we? When God brings us a message and he gives us marching orders for life, who are we that I could withstand God like the scripture says? Remember, let's keep in mind, we've got to get ourselves in our, in our mind. We've got to get our mind square with this thing. We've got to get our mind right with God and according to God's word. Uh, God does not need any of us. He can do whatever he chooses to do. He is sovereign. He's powerful. I said in the beginning, he can do the improbable. He can use the improbable to do the impossible. He can take two opposites and can attract them together and, and accomplish his purpose. When, when in our mind's eye, we would think there's no way 
that that could happen. God can do it. When the Spirit of God spake to Peter, Peter realized he had a responsibility to act. You know, the truth is, so do we. Sometimes we don't act the way we should. And can I tell you, when the Spirit of God speaks to you and lays that thing on your heart to do, and when God says, I want you to go and testify to this one or testify to that one, or I want you to get involved in this ministry or that ministry, can I tell you this morning, when we as Christians say to God after he brings that message, he say, well, I'm not really sure, God, that that's what you want me to do. So, yeah, I'm just going to think on it for a while. And what eventually ends up happening is we just don't do it. Can I tell you this morning... When that happens and that scenario unfolds in our life, we are in sin. And that means that our prayers are going to be hindered. That means when we pray for loved ones, when we pray for special things, when we pray for our needs, they are hindered. Why? Because we're disobedient and we're sinful. That's why we have to act when God says to act. It's not an option. When God brings the Spirit of God on us and convicts us that, we're need to, that we need to act, uh, it's not optional. God's not saying, well, if you feel like it. No, God directed Peter this, this in our story this morning. He directed Peter and says, I want you to go with these three men because you're going to go visit somebody who I have determined needs the essential message that you have. And so I want you to get up and get going and get to him. And I want you to preach it. Thus saith the Lord. When we hinder God. And we don't do what God says for us to do. We are in sin. You see, we think the Spirit of God lays something on our heart and it's an optional thing. It's like God saying, well, if you, if you feel like it, if you want to, you know, you pick it A, B, C, or D, and you can choose whatever you No, God is specific. Nothing could be further from the truth. Sure, our free will allows us to disobey God. And when we use our free will to disobey God and nothing adversely happens to us at that very moment, we think to ourselves, well, hey, I've gotten away with it. God laid this on my heart. I didn't really feel comfortable with it, so I just didn't do it. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of okay. I've got away with it. God's not going to do anything. Can I tell you, God doesn't always pay on Fridays, but he always pays. If you think for one second that God is going to forget about something when he allows you to be part of his ministry allows you to be used of him to lead somebody and give somebody that essential message and we just decline it and don't do it and yet we're not going to have any adverse consequences you have got another thing coming if you think that way god doesn't always pay on fridays but he always pays make no mistake god's direction and commands for his children are not optional uh, the meeting of the church together in fellowship is also not optional for those christians who believe uh, that they can just sit to home and not participate in a local church. Uh, the, the God gives a command. The book of Hebrews tells us as Christians not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And as a matter of fact, it goes on to say, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Guess what's happening? The day is approaching. And that means for we Christians, we got to be coming together so much the more. You know, if we're honest this morning, We've probably all slipped a little bit in our relationship with the Lord over the last several weeks because we haven't been able to come to the church house. Now listen, if you're there this morning and you're saying to yourself, well, I haven't, I've actually grown closer to the Lord, then I say, praise the Lord, thank God for you. But I know this, it's been difficult for me as a pastor to focus with all of the things going on around and being at home and trying to, to conduct a, the same kind of ministry that I usually conduct here at my church office without distractions, it's been a little bit more difficult to do it at home. So I believe without a doubt that I personally slipped some and my relationship could be improved with the Lord. And I'm hoping and praying and asking God to bring this thing to a conclusion very quickly so that we can get back to the business of the church being open and being a place where we can interact with people as they come into our doors so that we can do the things that God has said that we're supposed to be doing. The church is essential. Now, let me close with this thought. I've visited the CLA, the Christian Law Association website, and, and I've sought their counsel on some of these things, and I believe uh, they're correct when they say that the church is essential. Uh, the CLA, the Christian Law Association, has determined that under the Constitution of the United States, the church is essential. 
and they have given us instruction of how we are to open the church back up if we so if we feel so led to do so. So this morning, let me tell you this: my plan at this point is to open the church back up for all who would like to attend on May seventeenth. That's a couple of weeks away. Uh, it will be after the governor's stay-at-home order expires here in Vermont. Uh, I'm not convinced that he'll not extend that even further. If I had to guess, I bet he will. But I'm just saying to you, we're going to open the church house on May 17th for all who would like to come and participate and worship together as a church family. Now, I'm going to put out some guidelines between now and then and give you some, you know, give you some things to think about as we come to do that. And but just be praying about that with me, if you would, this morning. Uh, be praying that God would allow us to, to have that come to pass without any adverse reaction or adverse effect, if you will, that we don't have to get into a big squabble over something. I don't want to get involved in that, but I know this. Through our story this morning, there was a man named Cornelius. There was another man named Peter. Peter had the essential message that Cornelius needed. And under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God, Peter was obedient. And under the spirit of God's leadership, Cornelius was obedient. And he brought that essential message from Peter to Cornelius. He took two opposites that would have not attracted in a million years. God did the uh, used the improbable to do the impossible. And I believe several people at Cornelius' house that day were saved and gloriously birthed into the family of God because there was a man named Peter who had the essential message that every man needed. And can I tell you this morning, this world that we're living in needs the essential message that the church brings. They need a place where they can come and be encouraged during this time. There's people that are hurting. There's people that are having trouble financially and it's putting an excessive stress on them. The church is essential. And as far as I'm concerned on May 17th, unless something drastic takes place between now and then, May 17th, we'll be here together and we'll have our church house open once again. And I'll give you more details about that as it comes. But right now, let's go ahead and close. Ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, thank you for our time this morning. We ask your help. And Lord, we ask that you would give our leaders wisdom, that they would rely on uh, facts and not models. That they would rely on the data that's provided through what we've learned through the virus and not some person's thought processes as far as what all this means but they would just take the facts at hand. They would listen to more than just one expert. And that Father, they would make decisions that are based on the truth rather than just on this uh, hope so fiction that they tend to operate within. Lord, help us as a church family to stay united in this. And Father, I pray that you protect our church members, give them grace, protect them from the virus and any other sickness that might come their way. And Lord, we're looking forward to the day that on May the 17th, as far as uh, your concern if you're allowing us to do that lord we would love to be able to meet as a church family we're asking you to bring it to pass and father we'll begin to trust you and, and we're trusting you as we have through this whole thing and lord we'll trust you for this as well lord give us direction and pray god i'm uh, praying in, uh, that god you would bring to pass these things and father we'll pray in jesus name and for his sake amen thank you for joining us this morning if you would like more information about our church you can reach out to us faithbaptistvt.org. Send us an email and we'd be happy to get back with you. Uh, tune in again on Wednesday uh, midweek uh, for our Wednesday night service. Thank you for being here this morning. Good day.